Welcome to week three. We are focusing this week on the legitimate restriction to freedom of expression under international human rights standard. Before turning to an analysis of this restriction though, I shall first recall what the right to freedom of expression entails. We will take as our driver Article 19 of the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights because the wording of the regional provisions is very similar to that of Article 19. Because as well a number of constitutions around the world have taken the article as their model for constitutional provisions. We will briefly discuss the meaning of the first two paragraphs of Article 19. The paragraph related to freedom of opinion and the second paragraph which lays out the scope of freedom of expression. So, notwithstanding some differences across regional and international provisions, the protection of freedom of expression follows more or less the same wording. First, everyone has the right to hold opinion without interference. Second, everyone has the right to freedom of expression and that right includes freedom to seek, receive and import information and ideas of all kind, regardless of frontiers, orally in writing or in print, in the form of media or through any other media of their choice. So, freedom of opinion is usually the first provision laid out in freedom of expression. In Article 19 it says everyone should have the right to hold opinions without interference. That concept of opinion is sometimes confused with expression. However, these are two different concepts. An opinion is usually what precedes the expression. The expression is the vocal or written expression of an opinion. An opinion is akin to thought and conscience. Not all opinions are actually expressed. Under international human rights law, there is no limit permissible to freedom of opinion, to freedom of thought, or to freedom of conscience. Let me quote here from the Human Rights Committee in its General Comment 34, which is in your reading list. And it says very clearly that a reservation to freedom of opinion would be incompatible with the object and purpose of the covenant. What it means by reservation is that it can never become necessary to derogate from freedom of opinion during a state of emergency, for instance, or in fact at any other time. So there is no exception or restrictions possible or permitted to freedom of opinion. That includes the right to change an opinion whenever and for whatever reason a person so freely chooses. All forms of opinions are protected, including opinions of a political, scientific, historic, moral or religious nature. The holding of an opinion cannot be criminalized. That's very important. The harassment, intimidation or stigmatization of a person, including their arrest, detention, trial or imprisonment for reason of their opinion, constitute a violation. Let's now turn to the second paragraph uh, of Article 19. Everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to seek, receive and import information and ideas of all kind. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the verb to seek. And I'm going to ask whether or not it includes information held by government or public or quasi-public entities. Meaning, do the people, do the citizens, those individuals have the right to seek information, meaning to request information. Was that the meaning that the drafters of Article 19 gave to that particular verb? Indeed, throughout the evolution of the jurisprudence on that particular verb, court and uh, expert bodies have concluded that the information that can be requested under Article 19 does include information held by public body. That the verb seek clearly means that Article 19 embraces a right of access to information held by government and public body. Such information includes records held by a public body regardless of the form 
in which the information is stored, its source and the date of production. In their 2004 joint declaration, the international expert appointed by the UN, the uh, Inter-American System and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe to monitor freedom of expression determine that, and I quote, the right to access information held by public authorities is a fundamental human right. We should be given effect at the national level through comprehensive legislation based on the principle of maximum disclosure, establishing a presumption that all information is accessible, subject only to a narrow system of exceptions. Indeed, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has recognized without doubt the right to access governmental held information. This was done in the seminal case Claude Reyes versus Chile, and we will have the opportunity to return to this case, so I'm not going to elaborate on it now. The European Court, on its part, has recognized the right, but only so far for the media and NGOs. Uh, it has emphasized that the right to gather information is an essential step in journalism and is an inherent protected part of press freedom. It has concluded the same thing for non-governmental organizations that seek information in the public interest. But so far, the European Court has stopped short of concluding that there is a general right to access information held by government. However, as we will see in uh, the, the next week, that right has been recognized by a majority of governments and countries around the world. All right, let's now look at the next two verbs in Article 19, receive and import. So freedom of expression includes the right to both receive and import information and ideas. What does that mean? It means the right of listeners and speakers, the right of observers and demonstrators. Those rights are equally protected. It is a right to receive and the right to import. Let's now turn to the next segment of Article 19, either orally, in writing or in print, in the form of art or through any other media of their choice. So what exactly is included in this provision? Well, the, the short answer is more or less everything. It protects all forms of expression and the means of their dissemination. It includes spoken, written, sign language, non-verbal expression as image and object of art. It includes books, newspapers, pamphlets, posters, banners, dress, code and legal submission. It includes also all forms of audiovisual as well as electronic and internet-based mode of expression. It includes political discourse, commentary on public affairs, canvassing for election, discussion of human rights, journalism, cultural and artistic expression, teaching, religious discourse, commercial advertising, and it even includes, as we saw last week, deeply offensive expression. Indeed, expression in Article 19 and in the regional provisions is broad and is not confined to political, cultural or artistic expression. It is not conf confined to expression that are popular. It also includes controversial, false and even shocking expression. Just because an expression is disliked or thought to be false does not justify it to be censored. Some speech, as we will see in the following week, are subject to heightened protection. So the other forms of speech are protected, but there are some speech that benefit from even a greater degree of expression. These are political speech, speech concerning public officials and the media. Before ending this segment, let's focus uh, briefly on Article 13 of the American Convention on Human Rights, because it includes a few more speech that are protected, or rather a few more restrictions that are not allowed. First, prior restraint, meaning restriction or censorship before a speech is made public. That form of censorship is not allowed, except under very specific 
conditions related to the protection of children. So that's the concept of prior restraint. Second, indirect censorship is also not allowed under the American Convention and Article 13, which states, and uh, I, I quote, the right of expression may not be restricted by indirect methods or means, such as the abuse of government or private controls over newsprint, radio broadcasting frequencies or equipment used in the dissemination of information or by any other means tending to imped the communication and circulation of ideas and opinion. Indirect censorship, as we highlighted last week, is specific to the uh, American Convention. Finally, in Article 14, so the article right after the article related to freedom of expression, the American Convention recognized the right of reply and correction. I'm going to quote here this article because we haven't dealt with it before. Anyone injured by inaccurate or offensive statement or ideas disseminated to the public in general by a legally regulated medium of communication has the right to reply or to make a correction using the same communication outlet under such conditions as the law may establish. The right of reply and correction. Now, that is a controversial topic. Indeed, many in the press freedom community consider that the right of reply and correction is a restriction to freedom of expression, not uh, an expression of freedom of expression. And they see that as a restriction because it usually forces a media outlet, meaning the editor, to publish something they may not have done otherwise, to publish something they in fact disagree with. And that contradicts the principle of editorial independence. I belong to those who see the right of reply and correction as strengthening freedom of expression, and that for two reasons. First, it allows different and indeed contradictory viewpoints to be aired or read. The person who wishes for their right of reply to be exercised will put forward an opinion or an idea that had not been seen before. And second, the right of reply often acts to stop or prevent costly lawsuits. People who are given the right to reply in a newspaper or indeed through other media outlet may then not be tempted to sue for defamation or other any uh, reasons. So the right of reply is often seen as an alternative to a costly lawsuit and that benefits everybody involved. 